Hello to everyone joining our webinar this evening. We'll give folks a minute or two to join the presentation and then we will get started. Hello to everyone joining us. We're just going to give a minute or two here to let everyone join the presentation and then we will get started. Why don't we get started here? So hello again uh, to everyone who is joining us this evening. Welcome to How to Select Rain Garden Plants. Um, this is the third webinar that uh, we've had the pleasure of hosting with Melinda Myers this season. Uh, my name is Kelly Bolter. I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. And we are so happy that you're spending your evening with us. Um, uh, we have a lot of workshops and more webinars coming up this spring and summer with Melinda um, and our friends at MMSD. So keep an eye on our calendar at mpl.org. We've got some in-person rain barrel workshops and then um, some more webinars um, with Melinda as well. So if you uh, would like to chat with your fellow participants, you can use the chat box on the bottom of your screen. We will have time at the end of the presentation for Q&A with Melinda. So um, please share all of your questions in that Q&A box. You'll see that at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, you'll notice that your microphone is muted. So again, we'll have that Q&A time to answer your questions. Um, you should have received the handout that Melinda will use this evening in your emails a couple hours ago. Um, I'll be posting a link to that handout in the chat momentarily as well. Um, and we'll also be sending a follow-up email um, following the presentation here with a link to the recording, uh, which will be posted on the library's YouTube channel, um, usually within a few days. So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Melinda for tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, talking rain gardens is one of my favorite topics, I have to tell you, I've been lucky enough to travel around the country uh, speaking to gardeners. And about 15 years ago or so, I was on the east or the west coast. And when I mentioned rain gardens, back then, we were leaders. We were trendsetters here in the Midwest, which I'm always proud to say. So if any of you are from the east or west coast of the U.S., I'm sorry, but we get to claim one thing that we're leaders in. But um, the Great Lakes, we've really looked at how we manage water. And I think MMSD, Fresh Coast Guardians, really want to make sure that we manage our water on our landscape, good for our landscape, good for our plants, keep water out of our storm sewers, and rain gardens are a beautiful way to do that. So let's get started. I always like to thank the sponsors because that lets me do this for free. Um, Fresh Coast Guardians, we'll talk about at the end, and Milwaukee Metro Sewage District that sponsored this webinar. And also Kelly and all the folks at Milwaukee Public Library who host the events, post them on their YouTube, help us reach all of you. So thanks to them as well. So let's talk plants. When we're looking at rain garden plants, it's really important to pick the right plant for the growing situation. True of any garden, right? But especially rain gardens, because we're trying to capture water that runs off the roof, the walks, your lawn, capture it for a short term, let it drain through the soil so the plant roots in the soil can clean it before it recharges in the groundwater, trying to stop it from overflowing the sidewalk, the curb, and ending up in the street and the storm sewers. So these plants are going to be subject to some flooding when we have a lot of rain, and then drought when we don't have rain. Last thing you want to do is go out there and water your rain garden, right? So we're looking for plants that tolerate flooding and drought, and a lot of those are our prairie plants. Now, we always want to have something hardy, 
And I know that we've always had people from all over the country joining us. So the USDA, as probably most of you know, updated their plant hardiness zone map. They have more data points. They took the data from 30 year period, 1990, 91 to 20 to 2000, would that be 2006, something, 2010. So 30 years in there. Um, and so, or from 2020. So they put that data together, they evaluated half of the country increased what a half a zone warmer, half of the country didn't change at all. But it allowed them to also identify some of those microclimates, areas where we have lakes or mountains or valleys that impact the water, oceans, great lakes, smaller lakes. For those of you in Wisconsin, in case you haven't seen it, there's a little sliver of zone six right along the lake. I used to live on 16th Street in uh, the city of Milwaukee. I had a brick house. My neighbor had a brick house. I had a brick garage. And I could grow a lot of things there that I can't grow now that I'm out further from the lake. I am supposedly a zone five B, but I really count on being more of a 5A because it gets pretty cold here at times. Zone plant hardiness, the zones are based on the average minimum winter temperature, and it doesn't take into account those outliers, you know, where we have those extreme cold. Think about the last few weeks where you lived. Um, at my house, we had 70 degrees one day. The next morning, I woke up to 13 degrees. So we're seeing lots of extremes. But this is one way we can pick plants that will tolerate the average minimum winter temperatures. The other thing we need to consider is sunlight. And that changes throughout the year when the sun's position, you know, the earth's position to the sun changes. And you know that. And then throughout the day. So in the spring, maybe your trees aren't leafed out. So you get more sun, then the leaves come out. So it's more shady the rest of the year. So seasonally, it changes too, based on our plants. And the other thing is throughout the day, you know, the east, the sun rising in the east, setting in the west, you're going to see some changes based on what's being shadowed and how much available light reaches the plants. When I lived in the city, my neighbor's house was probably about eight feet away from mine. And I thought, oh, that's pretty shaded because every time I was home, it looked pretty shady. But I had leftover plants, popped some things in that area that were sun lovers because I ran out of room. And lo and behold, they made it. And the thing was, I didn't realize because I was gone during the day, is it had enough sunlight throughout the day, little bits of sunlight going from east to west that it, those plants actually received enough sun for full sun loving plants. And when we talk full sun, we think six to eight hours of direct sunlight. I usually say eight because I know gardeners and we all cheat. Well, if I say eight, six will probably do. If I say six, probably four. More sunlight, a west facing location is a great place for full sun plants or any place where they get at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight. Part shade plants, three to five hours of direct sunlight. You know, an east facing location is perfect. Um, maybe dappled shade underneath a tree where it gets indirect light all day long. And then um, I picked simple three different bases because you can find dense shade, dappled shade, but let's keep it simple, right? And then for shade, two to three hours of direct sunlight. Again, it could be in dappled light that it receives all day. Um, so kind of judge by the plants you grow. I like to, when people say, can I grow this? I have a lot of shade. I'll ask, what are you growing in that location? What's doing well? What didn't? And that's a way you can judge how much light that area is getting. What's doing well? Plants that require the same sunlight are good additions to those gardens. Soil is another factor. When we talk about how to plant your um, rain garden, we're going to talk about preparing the garden bed, which includes for most of us, adding organic matter, because most of us do not have ideal soil. And I always like this diagram because it kind of shows you where the problem lies or the challenges. So on the left is clay soil. Those particles are small and hold moisture. Good thing is they hold nutrients. That's how fast or slow, I should say, the water drains in clay soil versus on the far right, sandy soil, larger particles, and it drains quickly. Doesn't hold the nutrients as well either. And loam has equal parts of sand, silt, and clay, so a variety of particle size. So it holds the moisture longer than sand, but drains better than clay. So knowing your soil and the plants that tolerate it will help you be successful. 
And then we always want to think about what are the added values we can get out of our landscape. Um, I love to bring in the songbirds because winters are long here in Wisconsin. This year, not so much, but the birds add motion and color and entertainment. I love to watch them. Planting plants that attract them, that's nature's bird feeder, right? I don't have to clean it. I don't have to refill it. It brings in the songbirds that then are there and help eat the insects that they're protecting my garden plants from. Also planting for pollinators. We know how important bees, butterflies, hummingbirds are. Again, adding color and motion for our enjoyment, but helping our plants as well. Making sure that you have year round interest um, wherever you live. You know, those of us in the north, we're looking at seed heads and dry grasses. Fall can be a beautiful time of the year, as can be spring as plants start to emerge. So look for those plants that can provide interesting texture, color, and form throughout the year. I'm going to talk about a few grasses and sedges tonight. When I think of those, I think of intermixing them with my flowering plants. They can provide unity in your garden. So when you have a variety of different flowering plants, using some grasses or sedges with those grass-like leaves provides that unity. They also can provide support. When I talk about asters, especially the taller ones, think about them in your garden bed. You may end up pinching them to keep them short and compact so they don't fall down. Nobody does that in nature, but if you look at where they grow, there's often sturdy neighbors or grasses or sedges that can help hold them upright. And that's a great way to reduce your maintenance as well. So when I talk about the different plants, you'll see these symbols to help you along the way. The handout has even more detail than you'll see on the slide. And I'm covering a lot of plants and these are all the plants on most of the plants that MMSD is providing at their rain garden plant sale. And I'll talk about that at the end, um, but there's more detail on the handout, but I'm gonna try to cover a couple of things that I think will help you in your selection process. But know that the handout has a lot of those details. These plants are listed, we're starting with full sun plants, then we'll go to part, full sun to part shade, and then those shade tolerant plants towards the end. Then we're going from shorter plants to taller plants. And I thought covering them this way might help you as you plan your rain garden. In terms of short plants in the middle of a rain garden, they're not gonna show up, right? And so they're gonna be closer to the edge of the garden where those taller plants, depending on their moisture tolerance, um, may be able to go in the center or they may be towards the back of the rain garden so you have better visibility. So let's start with the six inch prairie smoke. I use this in my regular gardens as well as a lot of my native garden beds. And a couple reasons I like it. The leaves look good all season long. It does spread slowly, not obnoxiously. So it makes a great ground cover that doesn't overtake its neighbors. You can see the flowers here are kind of downward facing, pink, dark pink. And then it's called prairie smoke because the seed heads look like smoke. So you've got um, blooms early in the season, the seed heads that persist for a while and the leaves that look good all season long. And so it's a nice edger. It takes it uh, wet to dry. So it'd be a great plant along the edge of your rain garden. When we think of our rain gardens, the center where the water collects, that pool, that pond, those that's where our wet moisture loving plants go. Along the edges, that's where our plants that tolerate drier conditions should go. If you've grown Coreopsis, you know many of them reseed readily and lance leaf Coreopsis is no ex exception. It blooms all summer long and you can look at all those seed pods and look at how it's spread through this garden bed. And so if it does stop blooming all season or you've got more of it than you want, it's crowding out some other plants, you might wanna dig and divide because digging and dividing breaking up those larger clumps into smaller pieces can help invigorate a plant. And so it can help keep it blooming. Otherwise, a little deadheading um, as the flowers fade will keep it blooming and will also reduce some of the reseeding just in case. You wanna leave some of the seeds on because the birds like the seeds for this Coreopsis. Again, this is one that takes it moist, well-drained to dry. So it could be along the upper edge of the pond of your rain garden as well. 
Harebells, although these look so delicate, don't they? They do tolerate dry soil. So again, because of their delicate nature, they're only one to two feet tall. These would be good along the edge where they really stand out. And gardeners, we're always looking for blue or lavender called blue flowers as well. Um, related to camp campanulas, it's a type of campanula. Hummingbirds love these flowers, these bell-shaped flowers, as do bees. And again, another full sun plant that takes it dry once established. I love the uniqueness of these purple prairie clover plants. It is in the legume family, so it's got a deep tap root, making it very adaptable, but very difficult to transplant. So this is one, kind of think about where you want to put it and keep it because it's going to be hard if you go, oh, I don't quite like it there. You might want to rearrange the other plants around it. Um, so um, it does have the taproot, as I mentioned. It's a great pollinator plant. It does take it moist, well-drained. When you see mesic, it means moisture. And so moist to dry soil conditions. And look at that unique foliage, very fine foliage and those unique flowers as well. Prairie love grass. I have this in one of my garden beds as well. And sometimes before it flowers, I kind of like, oh, I don't know. It looks kind of messy. And then it starts blooming and I go, okay, it's definitely worth having. So the way you position it, keep that in mind. You may go, oh, I like that kind of random look of the grassy leaves, which I'm pretty casual as a gardener as well. Takes it dry. I love it because I have sandy soil. I water my plants to get them established, and then they really got to be pretty tough to survive in my garden. But look at those light, airy flowers. They're just so attractive, and they just change the whole appearance of this. Um, the good thing about this is it is not um, aggressive, so you're not going to end up with it eating your landscape. Deer tend to leave it be, and it's a host plant, so it supports certain uh, caterpillars as well. Wild petunia, a great ground cover. It does spread. I have to tell you my story. I had bought this plant under, I think not, I think I bought it as wild petunia, planted it in this garden bed when I lived in the city and it kind of took over and I dug it out and I thought, okay, this is a little too much. And this was many, many years ago. And then I, I saw this plant advertised. I'm like, oh, this is a nice plant and realized it was the same plant I dug up. It is a cool plant. It does like room to grow and spread. Mine really only grew probably less than a foot tall. And a lot of it depends on how much light and the soil conditions it receives. It blooms all summer long. And they're this beautiful, almost a periwinkle blue flower color. Perfect flower for hummingbirds as well. A great ground cover. So this is an excellent one. Um, again, it's mesic dry. So that means in those drier portions of your rain garden. Sweetgrass. I was telling Kelly I'm reading Braiding Sweetgrass and kind of slowly working my way through the book. And it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it. A lot of insight. She's a botanist that teaches. She's a professor. Um, she's um, also an indigenous, one of the indigenous populations, I forget which tribe she's um, from, but she really brings a lot of culture, a lot of history, and a lot of science together. And they did some research on sweetgrass, because I was going to plant this before I read the book, and I thought, oh, fragrant leaves, that sounds wonderful, you know, used in a lot of different ways, but I read it was very aggressive, and so I was a little nervous. Well, they did research, because this is used for making baskets, and what they found is harvesting it kept the population of grass healthy. In areas where it really filled in and it got crowded, it started to decline. So that really tells you that regular dividing not only will keep it contained if you're in a smaller space and don't have room for it to you know, spread a whole acre, but it will also keep it a healthy plant. So fragrant leaves, um, fragrant leaves, the deer tend to leave it be very attractive plant, something that I'm gonna add to my landscape this summer. 
Sky Blue Aster. Um, this one is adaptable, so that's a nice thing. It will take a little light shade. Aren't those flowers beautiful? It's one of those two to three feet tall asters that if it's got enough sunlight, it probably will stand on its own. But putting some grasses next to it, I think one makes a nice combination, the light airy texture of the grass with these flowers, but will also help provide the support it needs. Um, so one of the things, just plan for neighbors that will take care of it. Great for birds. They love the seeds. Pollinators love those flowers and lots of uh, bee activity. Butterfly weed. We all want to support the monarch butterflies. If you have a small space and well-drained soils, this is a better choice than common milkweed. Common milkweed is a favorite of monarch caterpillars, but it's very aggressive. And so you either need to keep after it or maybe look for an alternative if you have limited space. Not only does that one spread by seed, but underground rhizomes making it hard to, to manage. Butterfly weed, on the other hand, is a clumper and it doesn't spread as readily. It does need well-drained soil. So that's important in full sun. There is a variety from Prairie Nursery. He found a naturally occurring variety of this butterfly weed. He's named clay because he found it growing successfully in clay soil. So if you're struggling because you have heavy soil, this might be one to consider. It likes dry, moist, well-drained, but prefers dry, well-drained soil. Um, I mentioned I have sandy soil now and I can grow butterfly weed much more effectively than I did in the city. Even though I had good soil, it was a little heavier. This plant is late to emerge in the spring. So don't be anxious to clean out the garden because you might clean out this plant. So leaving the stems in place or marking it uh, just so you know it's present is a good way. Beautiful orange flowers look nice with blues and purples. Side Oats Grandma. I have to tell you, I did a, a new segment on starting native plants from seeds. And so if you've done this, you know, some seeds need a dry, cold period. Some need moist, cold. Some need warm, cold, moist. And this one only needs 10 days of warm conditions. So I used this and planted some seeds in the studio last week. I already have grass plants an inch tall. I'm going to be hardening those off and maybe trying to use some row cover to get them out in the garden, but they germinated quickly. So that was really fun to see. This plant's also called eyelash plant. Look at how the seeds, the flowers and the seeds are held perpendicular to the stem like little eyelashes. And so it's a really nice one um, to grow. Not overly aggressive, so it's a, a real good addition to the garden. I've seen that used in informal settings as well. I'm going to talk about at least two, I think just two liatris or blazing star plants tonight. This is liatris aspera, which is rough blazing star. This is the shortest of the two. It blooms August to September. Um, liatris, the flower buds on liatris open from the top to the bottom, which is kind of unique. Um, and I mention that because some people are concerned when they see the spikes of purple flowers that it's purple loosestrife. Purple loosestrife blooms open from the bottom up. So from a distance, that's a way to tell the difference. And then close up, you'll definitely see the difference. It's one of those plants, it's related to daisies. It's in the Asteraceae family. And so it attracts um, hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. But if you let that seeds form, they're fluffy and they've got neat texture and the birds will eat them. The seeds are pretty viable. So if this plant is growing in happy conditions, uh, you'll have lots of seedlings to start a new garden. The insect that you see on there, well, there's a, a butterfly, of course, but the insect is a soldier beetle and they're great pollinators, often mistaken for something harmful. So if you see that, he's doing you some kindness by spreading pollen. Showy black-eyed Susans. If you'd grown some black-eyed Susans like Goldstrom, you had terrible problems with leaf spot. This tends to be resistant. So we don't see a leaf spot uh, very often if at all on this one. Um, I think the showy black-eyed Susans, the black-eyed Susans, Rudbecki in general, really steal the show. That bright yellow gets everyone's attention. When I grew these in my front yard in my small city lot, I had people would say, what's that plant? That's beautiful. And I'm like, well, don't you want to see this one? I spent way more money on it. But that yellow always grabbed their attention as well as 
the birds eating the seeds, the butterflies and bees nectaring on the plant. So a great pollinator plant, great for the birds. Again, having those in your landscape, it'll help feed the birds. And especially this time of year, um, as they're migrating through in the next month or two, anytime we can provide some seeds and berries in the landscape, as well as things that are bird feeder, it's helping them. This is a great plant for small space gardeners, the verveins I'm going to talk about tonight. Hoary vervain takes it dry. This is the one I grow because I have sandy soil and things tend to be dry. It's also a little shorter than the blue vervain, but spikes of lavender blue flowers that are just beautiful. It's a clumper and that's what makes it really a good choice if you have a small space, a small space rain garden. So you're not digging and dividing as often. Um, so it's a really nice one for those drier conditions. Um, not aggressive. The hummingbirds love this one. I find it much easier than cardinal flower for me to grow. So something to consider. Again, this one takes it dry and it's a little shorter. False blue indigo or blue false indigo. Um, I This plant's a, a nice plant. It's in the legume family. And so you may or may not know legumes can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere with the help of a soil bacteria that helps fix that nitrogen, pushing it into the soil for plants to use. So don't need a lot of fertilizer. In fact, it's helping to fertilize the soil. Those spikes of blue flowers are beautiful. Then they turn into black pods. And one of the things I found when I was um, out cleaning my garden um, in the spring, when the wind blew, they just rattled and it sounded like wind chimes. So it added that element to the garden as well. So you've got blue flowers, black seed pods that really contrast nicely with kind of the bluish tinge to that green foliage. So just a really nice plant. It's big though three to five feet tall and wide. I put this in front of um, the window of our shop where my partner works and he was like, oh, can we like prune that plant? So I am gonna end up cutting it back after it blooms just so that he can see out the window because it does have a tap root. So it makes it a little challenging to move. Showy milkweed, like common milkweed, tends to be pretty aggressive, spreading by rhizomes as well as seed. But look at those cool flowers. So if you have the room or you, you know, can be persistent and keep it under control, it's definitely a good one to consider. And so showy um, milkweed, like other milkweeds, and I forgot to mention this with butterfly weeds, um, not only... Uh, support monarch caterpillars, but they attract hummingbirds to the flowers, a variety of butterflies nectar on the flowers, as well as bees. So you'll see hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies on the blooms, and then some monarch caterpillars munching on the leaves. It will take it moist to dry as well, but make sure you've got the space. Swamp milkweed is one I find is not as aggressive as common or showy milkweed either. It's a clumper. It's bigger than uh, butterfly weed. It has fragrant pink flowers. You can see here the monarch butterfly likes to nectar on the flower, as do other butterflies, bees, and uh, hummingbirds. It tends to be a clumper. I've had some people say they've had problems with it spreading, but that's one where you could just clip off the pods and then not let the seeds spread where you don't want them. So it tends to get larger by a clump, but a great plant for the monarch caterpillars and tolerates it moist as the name swamp, sometimes called red milkweed um, will tolerate. Pale purple coneflower is native to Wisconsin. Purple coneflower is not, it's native south of here, but both are North American native plants and very popular in gardens and rain gardens. Pale purple coneflower blooms a little sooner, a little earlier than purple coneflower is a little bit more adaptive. It doesn't tolerate wet, soggy soils, but it'll take it dry to moist, well-drained. So a little bit more tolerant of a variety of conditions than the purple coneflower. The look on the plant is a little different too. Those Petals droop down and they're much finer. Meadow Blazing Star is another liatris, and this one is a favorite of monarch butterflies. Um, if you ever go to Prairie Nursery's website, and they've got great information on native plants and goes into great detail, as does Prairie Moon out of Minnesota. And so he talks about this being one of the best, one of the favorite plants for monarch butterflies to nectar upon. Um, 
again, when you look up close, they kind of, it's hard to believe they're related to daisies and asters, right? But they're in that family. And just a beautiful plant, tall, spiky, very narrow and upright. The leaves are very narrow and fine, kind of in a whirl around the stem. Um, I had problems with this, not problems. I had it reseeding readily at my in my garden in Milwaukee. I had wonderful soil that I'd mended for years and used lots of organic mulches. Um, we've tried to get it established in our rain gar in our garden, one of our garden beds at State Fair Park, and we've just had trouble. And I think it's the soils just we haven't been able to build those soils as deep as they would prefer. I have this growing in my sandy soil, and they're okay, but they're not really spreading like they did in my home garden. So probably what I need to do is make sure they get watered a little bit better to get them established, but they will take it dry. And again, a great one for supporting the adult monarch butterfly. Goldenrods are really important for pollinators because they're late in the season and they really support those pollinators that are either getting ready to hibernate or migrate, but they can be very aggressive and stiff goldenrod is one that does reseed readily and so you'll want to make sure that you do um, give it room to grow or manage it and keep it um, contained. Or as the flowers fade, take some of them back so it doesn't recede. It spreads by seeds readily. So doing a little bit of deadheading, uh, leaving some seeds for birds, but also maybe taking some out so you don't have as many seedlings forming is a great option. The yellows look great in the fall, right, with our purple asters and some of the other fall colors. Um, a nice plant, it is tall, it can go in, it's wet to dry, so it could go in the middle of your rain garden um, to any of the drier edges as well. We have a cultivar of this growing at State Fair, or we did. I think we're getting rid of it because it reseeded readily and is taking over the garden, and we just can't keep it under control. If you look at it here, though, they've this is a perfect pairing. If you've grown Monarda, uh, this is wild bergamot, the purple, it reseeds readily. So here we've got two plants that reseed readily so they can kind of find their way with each other and kind of equally compete. So if you've got space and you want to grow some of these aggressive, more aggressive plants, give them room and then plant them with other aggressive plants because then they can kind of work their way through and find their own space. I had a wonderful, I heard a wonderful talk by Evelyn Howell, who is a landscape architect professor at UW-Madison. And she said, you know, we look at a prairie that's thousands of acres of an ecosystem and try to push it into a small city lot or a garden bed. And we expect it to act like the prairie. But if you look at the prairie, there are areas of rudbeckia, there are areas of coneflower, there's areas of, you know, different plants have kind of found their position in the prairie. And so we have to kind of intervene a little more than uh, nature because we're trying to do it on a much smaller scale. It is a beautiful plant. It's long blooming. Those yellow flowers are great. It's tall, though. So you want to make sure that, one, you're not going to block views with this tall plant or, you know, create visibility problems for traffic or the driveway or people walking by. But again, it's that beautiful yellow flower. Here's the other vervain. This is the blue vervain that likes it moist. And it's another one that you can grow in small spaces. Nice vertical accent. So it's a great plant for that position to use in that way. Um, and it's not aggressive at all. Uh, moist conditions. Uh, you can see it's here with purple coneflower that likes moist to well-drained soils as well. Again, a great pollinator and hummingbird plant and a good vertical accent. This one's taller than the one that's good for dry soil conditions. So we're going to move plants into a little more shade. Most of these will take full sun to part shade. And if you've grown wild strawberry, you know it's a very adaptable ground cover. It does kind of wind its way where there's space available. One of the reasons to include it, it takes it wet or it takes it dry. So this might be a good one on the upper edge of your rain garden because it is a low grower. Nice looking leaves all season, white flowers, edible fruit. They're tiny, but you and the birds could enjoy them. And then red fall color. So you've got multiple seasons of interest from this plant, which I think is a real plus. 
nodding pink onion. If you plant this, you will have many. And I know this from personal experience. I have this in one of my garden beds. And what I need to do is to deadhead it before it has a chance to set seed. Any of the alliums, my ornamental alliums reseed readily. My chives are growing out of my patio, any crack they can find for the seeds to drop in. So I need to do a better job of deadheading. So once the pollinators have had their chance to visit the flowers and the flowers are fading and before the seed set, if you want to manage these easily, do that. Otherwise, they're easy to identify. The grass-like leaves smell like onions, so you can easily pull those and compost them if need be. Only a couple feet tall. Again, they take it wet to dry. Downy wood mint, and don't let that common name scare you because it is one that is not as aggressive. Um, if you, it does take more space than you want, just dig it out and divide it or remove some of the faded flowers. Um, there are some uh, birds that may feed on the seeds. Otherwise, taking those faded flowers out after the pollinators have had a chance to visit is a way to manage them. I love the unique flower arrangement on these. It's quite um, eye-catching. Again, this is only a couple feet tall, so it'd be good towards the outer edges of your rain garden where it tends to be a little bit drier. Wild lupine. Lupines like it cool, even though it's hardy. I think from three to eight is where it's hardy. Um, the beautiful blue flowers, this is uh, Lupinus perennis, the native lupine. I find I get better bloom when I have cooler spring and early summer. If the temperatures get really hot when it's ready to bloom, I don't get the great flowering or it doesn't last as long. The leaves are very attractive, even without the blooms. And this is another member of the legume family. And so it's another nitrogen fixer. So it's helping to feed the other plants in the garden. Um, it likes it dry and well-drained. It's native to kind of rocky areas. You'll often see it growing in out um, crops of stone, places like that, often in areas where it's a little bit cooler. So even though it's full sun to part shade, maybe giving it a little afternoon shade, maybe having something a little taller that blocks that hot afternoon sun will allow you to have better bloom on this one. Common yarrow, you will see this plant listed in perennial books, in weed books, and native plant books. It is native, tolerates hot, dry conditions. It is a tough plant. It is very aggressive. Um, invasive plants are usually, at least for Wisconsin and many states, are only considered invasive if they're non-native and they leave their garden, the landscape for woodland or prairie areas. So this is a native plant. Um, uh, if you place it, a friend of mine who has a beautiful prairie planting uses this and says her other plants help keep it in check. So as long as, again, you have equally assertive plants, you'll be fine. Fine foliage, so it's great, kind of has that smell. You either love or hate, um, makes a great cut flower, reseeds readily, so you will have it for years to come. Um, another good, really drought tolerant, full sun plant. Brown fox sedge. Um, I used to not find this to be aggressive, but I'm growing in very sandy soil and it tolerates it dry. I probably, mine had to survive on benign neglect and it was doing fine. But I think if you've got richer soil, moister soil, it can be aggressive. So it's one to keep in mind. I reminds me, the growth habit reminds me a bit of prairie drop seed that we'll see in a little bit. This is a lot more aggressive, prairie drop seed is not. But again, it's one that takes full to part sun, moist to dry, well-drained soil conditions. So this could be one that could be towards the center of your rain garden, put it with some equally assertive plants and you'll reduce your maintenance issues. Rudbeckia herta, another Rudbeckia black-eyed Susan. This takes um, full sun to part shade, but this is a biennial, meaning the first year it puts up leaves, the second year it flowers, sets seed and dies, but it reseeds readily. So it really acts like a perennial as long as you don't weed out the first year rosette. And some people will plant two plants two years in a row. So if you're buying a plant that's gonna bloom that first year, planting another one the next year, then you're getting seed set every year and it does look like a perennial. 
long season of bloom. Uh, birds love these seeds. Uh, pollinators love the flowers. And again, this is one that will reseed readily. Uh, being a biennial, um, just kind of be aware of its life cycle. Um, takes it well drained. You can see it takes dry soil once established, very drought tolerant. Great blue lobelia. If you've struggled with cardinal flower, which is lobelia cardinalis, a close relative, this is a good alternative. The hummingbirds like this as well. Beautiful blue flowers on spikes like cardinal flower, but I find it much easier to grow, not as fussy as cardinal flower. Now, there's always somebody in the group that's like, I have no problem with cardinal flowers. I had somebody say, I'm digging them and giving them away. No jumping worms in their yard and um, having, you know, no problems keeping alive. And then there are the others, myself included, who really had to work to find a spot where they'd grow. So this one is a late, mid to late summer bloomer. So it's adding color when a lot of plants are fading. It will colonize if it's happy, but I find it's easy to manage. It's not overly aggressive or hard to dig if it's spreading beyond what you feel its limits should be. So good mid to late summer uh, plant, lots of pretty blue flowers. Lead plant, and what it's hard to see in this, to me, that when I see this out in a prairie setting, the leaves are kind of almost a silvery green. So that adds to its appeal when it's not even in bloom. Blooms earlier in the season, these spikes of purple flowers. Again, hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees love this plant. It takes a couple years for it to be established, and you don't want to prune it back those first couple years. Let it stand. So you may need to mark its location so when you do your late spring cleanup, you don't cut it back those first couple years. So again, you know, we don't like to see plant tags. I leave them in my garden, so I know what I put in. But, you know, maybe a, a subtle wooden plant tag or something marking that location. So just like your butterfly weed, you don't want to weed that out. You don't want to cut this back the first couple of years to get it established. So it's got a, a really different look and texture to it. It takes it moist, well-drained to dry. So don't put it in the deepest part of your rain garden where the water tends to collect. New Jersey tea is a shrub. It forms a woody stem and it blooms in the summer, July and August. And the flowers attract lots of different insects. And that's what brings the hummingbirds because they're looking for a protein meal. So all those pollinators that this plant attracts brings in the hummingbirds and then the seeds as well. And some of the songbirds will be eating those insects too. So nice white flowers, um, deer tend to leave this bee. It's a shrub that a lot of people use in more formal or informal garden settings. No real good fall color, but nice looking leaves all summer. Summer blooms when not a lot of shrubs are flowering and great pollinator appeal. Foxglove penstemon. If you know penstemon, most of them really like well-drained to dry soils. This foxglove penstemon is much more tolerant of clay soils and will take it moist to dry conditions. If it's happy, it will reseed and spread. There's a beautiful planting of this at Lurie Gardens. If you want to see some gorgeous gardens in Millennial Park in Chicago, Lurie Gardens, they've mixed a lot of native plants with uh, cultivated plants, but great examples of how to combine the two or even use just natives together to create a beautiful garden. And so you can tell by looking at this is a great Early summer flowering plant to get you off to a good start, good vertical accent. And hummingbirds, again, and butterflies love this plant. Mountain mint. This is another one not to let the common name fool you. It is not like common mints, um, but um, it you, you can put it with plants that are equally assertive just to kind of keep it in check or do a little bit of dividing, but it's not at all like common mint. Um, it does like moist to wet soil. So this would be perfect in those wetter parts of your garden. Very unique looking flowers, right? Kind of that funky uh, tubular flowers on the outer edge of the heads. And so it's kind of a nice addition to the garden. It gives you a little different, unique look. Um, I was doing a webinar. Some of you may have joined me last night on hydrangeas. And one of the new introductions is called Sublime. 
time. And they're, it's a smooth hydrangea whose flowers are always green. And I laugh because that used to be something nobody wanted. And now green has kind of become a hip and trendy color, easy to blend different shades together. So one that you might want to consider. Our native little blue stem, beautiful leaves all season long, those blue green leaves, and they turn a nice kind of reddish, sometimes with hints of orange in the fall. And then the fluffy tufts of seeds on top. The birds love the seeds. The butterflies will do some nectaring. It's a late summer into fall bloomer. Um, blend, put it with some of your other flowers. If you have heavy soil, little blue stem tends to be floppy. A lot of the cultivars that have been introduced have been for more common compact, sturdier growth. But as you can see here, putting it with purple cone flower that tends to be a little more stiff and upright will help hold it upright if that's an issue. Good drainage to dry soil once established, best for this native grass. Prairie drop seed is one of my favorite. To me, it reminds me of fountain grass. So if you know the ornamental fountain grass, similar growth habit, but this one's native. So it helps support our birds that eat the seeds and bees that do the pollinating. It has fragrant flowers. Um, I think it smells like burnt popcorn, but somebody said coriander, which is probably more appealing if you're trying to sell the plant. Nice growth habit, nice fine textured plant. Best in full sun will take some shade. I've seen it in heavy shade. It doesn't bloom and it's a little more, not as compact and, and not as nicely shaped. Flowers late in the season. And then when the seed pods form and ice forms on them over winter, they look like little gems. I've seen this used in more formal plantings in downtown Chicago on the median strips. And I found them because I could smell them in the fall when they were in bloom. They mixed them with things like... Um, threadleaf coreopsis and sun tolerant coleus and things like that in a non-native setting. So it was kind of interesting to see this native plant used in a more formal setting, but great for a natural and rain garden as well. Blue wood asters. Um, this is another one that's um, potentially, it's got some, it could be aggressive because of the seed set. All the asters, if they're happy, seem to do a little bit of spreading. It's a late summer into fall bloomer. This one will take a little shade. Most, a lot of the other asters like full sun. So this is a nice addition here. So when you see mesic again, it means moist. And then dry mesic means good drainage to drier soil conditions. Those mesic prairie plants are subject to moist and dry conditions. And that's why they're perfect. Many of them are perfect for rain gardens as well. This does reseed readily and that's how it spreads. So again, when the flowers fade, removing those. Though I always like to leave things, even if they're not rated as a bird-friendly plant, you never know who's going to stop by and eat them, plus good winter interest. But if you're getting overrun with them, you might want to deadhead them. Lavender hyssop, agastache, agastache, talk to 10 different horticultur horticulturists, you'll find 10 different um, pronunciations. This is one of my favorite. This is in my um, no maintenance garden, my ode to Roy Diblick, who wrote the book. And I used a lot of native plants in here, including uh, lavender hyssop. I took this picture standing in the middle of a large planting bed of them and the butterflies and the bees they didn't bother to move. I just couldn't figure out how to get a nice video of all the activity. It was just so wonderful to see the skippers, the silver spotted skippers, the swallow tails. You could maybe see some of the bumblebees and honeybees and native bees nectaring on these plants. Long season of bloom, a little bit late to start. It does reseed. So I was a little worried last year. We had such a crazy spring, but boy, they caught up quickly once they sprouted and grew. Um, if you get more plants than you want, again, a little bit of deadheading, but the birds like these seeds. So I like to leave them up again. They're nature's bird feeder in my landscape. Wood mint and wood mint is another one that um, it's not usually aggressive, even though it's got that description. If it is getting a little bit, you know, forming dense colonies bigger than you want, then just divide it. But it usually stays as a colony versus eating the whole landscape. But again, 
uh, get out the shovel and just bring it down to size if you need to. The foliage is fragrant. You can see it has that typical mint kind of flower. And it's a favorite of many native bees. And I, I think you've probably, if you're here tonight, you're probably aware that much of our attention is going to supporting not only honeybees, but native bees, because they're so important to our pollination. This is a good one for wet soil. It will grow up to four feet tall, so it'd be perfect in that deep wet spot in the center of your rain garden. I mentioned cardinal flower earlier. Uh, it can take some shade, moist soils. It can grow in water features and water rain gardens. Um, finding the right spot for it is always a challenge. Tends to be short lived. Um, we'll do some reseeding. So watch for little seedlings as well. Those red flowers, nothing matches that spires of red flowers in the garden um, middle mid to late summer. Beautiful hummingbirds love it as well as pollinators. Wild bergamot, Monarda. If you've grown Monarda, you know it reseeds readily. I find though, if I go out in the spring after I know pollinators have left their winter homes, you know, and I need to thin out any cuttings, it's got that minty citrusy fragrance. So it's a little aromatherapy as I thin out that planting. Keeping good airflow and light penetration will reduce the problems with powdery mildew or just plant something a little shorter in front of it and nobody will be the wiser. This will take it wet to dry. So very adaptable, drier conditions, more subject to powdery mildew. Purple coneflower coming in after the pale purple coneflower, a little bit taller. Um, as you, this is probably the most popular native plant being planted in gardens and landscapes right now. Um, so our native species, beautiful plant. Birds love the seeds. The seed heads, I think, are attractive in the winter. You will have a lot. Um, the birds eat quite a few, but there's usually plenty to help start new seedlings. Uh, Aster yellows may be a problem where you get those deformed flowers. They may be green. They may have weird looking petals. Just dig out the infected plant as soon as you see it so it doesn't spread to your healthy plants by an insect, a leaf hopper that spreads the disease. But these reseed so readily that, you know, you can sacrifice a plant here and there. Plains oval sedge. So now we're moving into um, more shaded growing conditions. This one will take full sun to full shade. Look at those unique seed heads. Aren't those cool? This is another big one and it takes it wet to dry. Perfect for a rain garden. And it will grow in that center portion and can add um, the sedges have grass-like leaves, and then look at those unique seed heads, and the birds will come and feed on the seeds in winter. So very adaptable to light and very adaptable to moisture. Our native wild geranium, a woodland edge plant, so right along some partial shade works very well for this plant to a little bit heavier shade. It can form colonies, but not overly aggressive. The leaves hold up all season long, and just a nice way to start the season early and so great for those early visitors pollinators that visit your garden just a couple feet tall moist to moist well drain just avoid those really dry spots for this one if you're growing column behind chances are you have a lot of it um, i have some uh, wild columbine i think i planted two plants in a garden and the whole thing was taken over so i started weeding it out a bit but i love this plant early season bloomer when we're all dying for some color great for hummingbirds if they get to your garden early they nectar the nectar's in the spurs on this plant and so they're going to be reaching in for that as well as the bees and butterflies birds will eat the seeds so um, if you are being overrun, you can remove some of the seeds, uh, though I like to leave as many as possible for the birds. And it is a great hummingbird plant. It'll take full sun. It takes pretty good heavy shade as well. Unlike a lot of the cultivated varieties, I find this one is winter hardy, reliable, and returns year after year. And as I mentioned, does reseed readily. Big leaf aster, 
is another um, aster that is aggressive. Um, it will take shade though. So that's kind of one thing. It's hard to find asters that will tolerate part to full shade. And this is one that will do this. Great for pollinators. Another fall bloomer. We wanna make sure that we have plenty of pollen and nectar out there for our pollinators later in the season. It will take this uh, wet to dry. So that gives you lots of opportunities for placement in your rain garden. So a good fall pollinator plant, but keep an eye on it because it can be rather aggressive. Aggressive. Heartleaf Golden Alexander, it does um, spread by seed, but not as aggressively as Zizia um, aureus, sorry, I had to think for a minute, um, Golden Alexander can be somewhat aggressive. This one tends to be less so. You could tell the difference looking at the leaves. It's in the carrot family. And so if you know members of the carrot family, they're very appealing to beneficial insects. So those flowers say, really invite in the beneficial insects. An early season bloomer. First time I saw this blooming was at our nature center in um, Milwaukee County and growing kind of along with other woodland plants because this will go in full sun. So in a prairie setting to full shade, more of a woodland setting. So if you've got a shady area, you're trying to establish a rain garden. These next few plants are perfect examples of things to grow. And this will take it moist to well drain. Long beaked sedge, look at all of those seeds. This has the potential to reseed readily. I was reading about this in Prairie Nursery, Neil DeBull's description, and he goes, he's seen it in a lot of native places. He, he sells the plant too, and he just says, looking at all those seeds, it's one to keep an eye on. It takes it wet, it takes it dry. So this is a plant that really is adaptable in any part of your rain garden. Those grass-like leaves really can add that unity. Mix it in with some of those other reseeders like your Monarda, like your Rudbeckia, and that way they could kind of duke it out or the uh, Heliopsis, he that uh, early sunflower, those can kind of duke it out and really find their way to create a beautiful landscape. Mist flower. Um, I was visiting family. I grew up in Ohio and we had a family reunion on one of my uncle's farms. We were taking a hayride through the fields and there was a field just loaded with these. It was gorgeous. It was, um, I think this was in August, middle of August when I was down in Ohio and they were in full bloom and gorgeous. When I look at those flowers, they remind me of Ageratum, the annual Ageratum, uh, related to some of the Joe pie weeds. So this takes it wet to dry. This, these were growing in a dry field, nobody watered, but these will also take it wet. Again, allowing you to use it in many different places in your landscape. It does reseed readily. Um, you know, sometimes here's the deal. Some plants that are aggressive, I'll tolerate because I like them so much that I'll put the effort in to maintain them and contain them. And only you can make that decision. A great pollinator plant, but excellent uh, adaptability to the garden. Zigzag goldenrod, another fall bloomer, another one that spreads readily. So goldenrods, there are a couple of goldenrods like showy goldenrod and Ohio goldenrod that are less aggressive. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't plant them. It just means keep an eye on these. This will take part to full shade, which not all goldenrods will. So that's another benefit. It takes it wet and it takes it dry. It gets the name zigzag based on the way the flowers are arranged on the flower stem. So one that you want to keep an eye on because it spreads readily, but great for those pollinators. It's summer into fall bloomer, but very adaptable to soil moisture. Um, a summer bloomer, the anemones, and you're probably aware of there's Japanese anemone, there's a variety of anemones, woodland anemones, tall anemones, this is tall, grows a couple feet tall, um, part to full shade, beautiful, look at those beautiful white flowers, you know, white flowers in a shade garden really brighten things up, nice leaves all season, and then when they set their seed, they're little cottony tufts on the end of the flower stem. So the seed pods I find are attractive as well. Great pollinator plant, nice plant for those moist, well-drained portions of your rain garden. Virginia wild rye. This like so, looks like something I'd bundle and put on my front porch, right? Is a fall decoration. It takes full sun to full shade. It takes wet to wet, moist 
well-drained soil conditions. It's a big plant. So this would be a great one again in the center of the rain garden. Those little spiky things on the seed heads are called awns, A-W-N, and these are very sharp. And they were talking about um, with this one, putting it in the garden in a way that people won't grab them and get stabbed by them because it can be kind of spiky and uncomfortable. So this would be a perfect plant for the center of your rain garden. One, it'll be out of reach. Two, it's tall enough. And three, it tolerates the moisture. And then birds will come and help themselves to the seeds. So just a couple of just some inspiration on combining plants. When we think of rain gardens, they can be as beautiful as our regular gardens. They take some planning, looking at plants, putting them together that are equally assertive, colors that are complementary, textures that are complementary. Um, here we've got gray headed cone. This is my this is Stacy and Ken have this beautiful natural hillside prairie garden it's just gorgeous and this is her one cardinal flower she said she's had this one cardinal flower that comes back every year for five or ten years now so she's an amazing gardener so if you're struggling don't feel bad um early sunflower again um, you can kind of see the daisy like flowers, some gray headed cone flowers, the yellow with a more rounded and then, of course, wild bergamot. And notice how they're being allowed to just intermingle and grow together. Coneflower, pale purple coneflower, I should have said, in the front and um, penstemon to your upper left. And then there, um, the coreopsis is the lower yellow plant. But look at the texture of that pale purple coneflower. I think this one is at Lurie Garden. So lavender hyssop, coneflower, and uh, this is a fireworks goldenrod. This was at Fox Valley Tech College, but I love that fall combination, late summer or fall. Um, so we've got butterfly weed in the front. We've got rattlesnake master is the plant that if you look at the leaves and they look like a yucca, that's rattlesnake master and the round white kind of knobby flowers. There's some nodding onions to the left. Um, and then we've got, let's see what else. There's gray headed coneflower in the background. I think this is Dawn's house actually. Dawn works with me and here she's got Columbine combining with Baptisia. Um, Black eyed Susan with some coneflower and the spiky liatris. Uh, nodding onion, there's a lot of it. The uh, liatris or blazing star. You can see some more rattlesnake master as well. And gray headed coneflower in the background. Um, mostly if this is about the liatris or the blazing star with a little uh, butterfly weed to the lower left and Monarda to the upper right. Um, the prairie drop seed, look at the, this is at Midwest Ground Covers. It's a wholesaler that sells plants to uh, professionals. And so look at the prairie drop seed. The sedges are kind of the chartreuse that you see here. They've got yarrow mixed in. This is a Pete Udoff inspired design. Pete Udoff is a landscape designer out of Germany that uses a lot of native and cultivated plants together, things that really work well together from a competitive stage, from a aesthetic standpoint. Um, he designed Lurie Gardens and Millennial Park and quite a few others. Cup plant, if you're growing cup plant, it's really assertive. So you want to make sure, I read somewhere that it will crowd out canary reed grass and then you'll have cup plant, but I have an area that I need to crowd out some weed grass and I've got plenty of room that I think I'm going to add some cup plants and see if it really will crowd things out. Uh, the purple Monarda and Rudbecki in the front. So one of the complaints I hear from a lot of people who are putting in rain gardens is I want color right away. And if you're buying plants, we'll talk about the plants for sale at the MMSD plant sale. But the smaller you buy plants, the longer it takes for them to reach full size and blooming. The old saying is the first year they sleep, they're putting down roots. The second year they creep, they get a little bigger. The third year they leap. So if you want bigger impact, start with bigger plants. So this is my son-in-law, Roy. He was helping me. Um, I bought a lot of plants to put this no maintenance garden, mostly native plants, a lot of sedges, some coneflower, rattlesnake master, wild quinine. 
Um, and I started with gallon size pots or bigger. So it was an investment, but that was in 2019 in the fall. This was summer two years later. There's my agastache, my lavender hyssop. That was in the summer, just a different view, rattlesnake master. You can see there's not a lot of empty space. And this is what it looked like in the fall. So that's just two years after planting. Yes, there's some bare space in there, but this is fall. And boy, in two years, I had a lot of changes throughout the season. I put, I have hundreds of bulbs in there. So I've got color from the spring. Camasia is one of the bulbs that will take it wet. It's not native to uh, the Midwest. I think it's native to the Pacific Northwest. Green Bay Botanic Garden uses that in their rain garden. It's a spring blooming bulb, C-A-M-A-S-S-I-A. -S 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 so that'll take it moist. So you could do that or put some daffodils on the drier, kind of moist, but well-drained areas. If you want instant color, and I see a lot of rain gardeners putting in annuals, here's a couple of things to consider. Match the plant to the soil moisture. So remember those areas on the edge, the higher parts of your rain garden are gonna dry out faster. So look for drought tolerant plants, celosias, um, zinnias, things like that, that take it hot and dry. Those are annuals. So they'll give you color that first year while your perennials are filling in. Then for the center part of your garden, look for those that tolerate it moist. Cleome is a big plant. It'll fill up a lot of space. It takes it moist as well. Um, not a lot of your annuals really take wet soil conditions. And especially in the center where you need something tall, this would be a good choice. Balsam, um, impatience balsam mia, balsam plants are annuals. They're an impatient relative. They'll take it rather moist. Impatience I've seen growing in pots on a water's edge, um, but they're pretty short. So putting those in the moist areas, maybe on the edge, but I consider this one, it does reseed. So you might have the annuals you need the first year till your perennials take over. Kelly mentioned we have more webinars coming up, seven steps to managing water where it falls. So talking about other things besides rain gardens you can do. Give you advice on planting your rain garden, but also talk about caring for it once those plants are in the ground. And then next fall, if you haven't had enough of me by then, we'll talk about fall landscape planting and care, especially with pollinators in mind. Um, MMSD spring plant sale, hopefully you're all aware of it, goes on now until April 4th or until they run out of plants. So it ends April 4th or earlier and order early because they often do run out of plants. They are requiring a $45 minimum just to make it, you know, all the volunteer help and putting the orders together. But the plants are about 50% off of retail, but more importantly, they're plants you can't always find at most garden centers. So if you are in the MMSD service area, put your order in, you've got some idea of plants that you want um, and make sure that you take advantage of that. There are other webinars that I'll be hosting. I'll be at the Realtors Home and Garden Show next on the 23rd, but uh, visit my website, melindamyers.com for upcoming appearances and webinars. And then Kelly is never done with me. So we've teamed up with the libraries throughout Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan once again, and We Energies is our sponsor to help you create beauty outside your door. But everyone is welcome. You don't have to live in Wisconsin or the UP of Michigan. Um, I'll be doing a webinar every month. We'll have videos, we'll have activities, uh, things on container gardening, growing ornamental fruits and vegetables, and the June one is on underappreciated pollinators, things we often are annoyed by, but really help us out. Last but not least, and I appreciate you letting me go a little long, help me grow gardeners. This is my grandson, Sammy. He's my digger. This is a few years ago. We dug a dry riverbed, put a rain chain on that gutter to collect the water so it wouldn't flood the sidewalk in front of our house. And um, you know what? He's a digger. So that was a good project for him. He and I worked on doing that. But whether it's kids in your life, a young family down the street or an, in, a new retiree, help them find the passion and the joy and the benefits of gardening. And if you're a new gardener, welcome. We're happy to have you. It's a wonderful community. Stay in touch. All my contact information is on the handout and, of course, on my website, melindamyers.com. Thanks again to Fresh Coast Guardians and Milwaukee Metro Sewage District. MMSD has a bad rep. 
locally, you know, because we as residents only hear about when problems exist, but across the country, they're known for their in innovative, their innovations in terms of working with residents to capture rainwater and keep it on the landscape with medicine collections and hazardous material collections to keep it out of our waterways and landfills. And Fresh Coast Guardians, just everyday people trying to make a difference. And so sign up, there's great information on their website, things to keep you inspired and help you along your way. So check them out as well. And I want to thank you again. I went a little long. I thought I could just hit the highlights, but I always have more to say. So any questions that you may have, I'll be glad to help out. Thank you so much, Melinda. This was such a treat. Um, I hope it's getting everybody excited to plant their rain gardens. I put a link in the chat to MMSU's plant sale, which again, that closes April 4th, or if they run out of plants before then, so whatever comes first. Um, so yeah, let's get to questions. Let's see, I'm checking her Q&A box. Um, our first question is from Becky. Becky's asking, is there anything special to consider when creating a rain garden around a sump pump? Um, or should I create it the norm or what is she, should I create it the, the same way as a normal rain garden? Yeah, I would create it the same way. It, what you want it at least six, preferably 10 feet away from the house. So your sump pumps go to shoot out into the landscape. You're going to want to make sure you dig it deep enough so that if, you know, if you're in a place where your sump pump runs all the time, you're going to want it good and deep because you're going to be managing more water. So um, on the handout from our first one was a link, and on Fresh Coast Gardens, you'll find a link to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Rain Garden Guide for Homeowners and Professionals. And it takes you step by step, and it talks about, about calculating the amount of water that your rain garden needs to manage. And so I live in sandy, so I have sandy soil. I have a sump pump that I don't think has ever run, never since we've lived here. And when we bought the house, it looked like it never ran. But I know if you have heavier clay or maybe you're in an area with a high water table, you may have a sump pump running more often. So kind of pay attention to how much it's running. You may need to dig it deeper so you capture that water. You may need to concentrate more on wet tolerant plants. But again, you want to keep your rain garden at least six, preferably 10 feet away from the foundation of your home, because the last thing we want is water near that foundation. So great question. Your next question is from Jay. Jay's asking, uh, what, what is the butterfly weed that does okay in clay um, and who discovered this native plant? So it was Neil DeBull who owns Prairie Nursery and he's located in Westfield, Wisconsin. And so he sells plants and seeds. He's one, we're lucky um, there's in the Midwest, you know, buying your plants from locally grown sources is always best. Um, and he found this growing on heavy clay soil. He offers it through his uh, on through his nursery on his website. If you look up butterfly weed, there's one variety. It's a naturally occurring variety called, and he called it clay because he found it growing on clay soil. All right, our next question is from Terry. Terry says, what can you tell me about containing spread of these plants? Not every neighbor is on board with this, and there are still places where lawns reign supreme and spreading plants, native or not, aren't welcome. In my experience, it's pretty difficult to contain them to my own space. Um, I'm really just asking how to have a, a good idea for how much maintenance my garden will require before planting. That's a great question, Terry. When I lived in the city, I have to tell you, and I, my ex-husband was also in horticulture. And when we bought our house, everyone had sheared ewes and a row of geraniums and short grass. And we gradually started killing the plants in our up front and side yard and backyard was easy. Nobody saw that. And, and we did it over time. And I always left a mobile edge just to let people know this was intentional to make them feel okay. Um, but we did it gradually. And one of the things I found is by doing it gradually, it helped bring people on board. There were still people that 
I would hear go by, she's a crazy lady. But my my day when I felt good is some kid rode by, uh, by on his bike and he goes, nice garden lady. And I thought, okay, we've made it. So sometimes starting small, maintaining some grass. Um, you know, I had an electric mower. It took me longer to get it out of the garage than it did to cut the little bit of grass I had. Or putting um, bird houses or, sci you know, garden art or signs of civilization, we call it, sometimes makes people feel easier. So I tried to, to let you know the plants that are aggressive. So focusing on those like prairie drop seed doesn't spread readily. It's It may remind your neighbors of fountain grass. So that would be a good one. Butterfly weed, um, especially if you have good drainage, that one doesn't spread rapidly. The vervains for the wet areas, you could do the blue vervain. If your soil dries uh, fast, you could do the hoary vervain. Um, I'm trying to think of that list. Um, I found the Penstemon digitalis was an easier one, not too bad, but maybe you want to do the lobelia instead, <clears throat> the great blue lobelia instead. Those would be some plants if you concentrate on the ones that aren't reseeders. So on your handout, I didn't capture all of them that were aggressive, but I tried to say if it was aggressive, if it reseeded readily, um, things that tended to be hard to manage. And I get it. You know, we want you to be successful. So I want to make sure that you have plants you can manage because then you could be a good example for your neighbor because you're right. Not everybody sees a rain garden or a natural planting is beautiful, but if we can find ways to create beauty, which you're going to enjoy anyway, um, then it will be a way to help inspire others. So hopefully I've given you a few that um, I find pale purple coneflower for me doesn't spread as readily. The, the lavender hyssop, um, it will recede, but I don't. I find I don't find it taking over my garden, so that might be one. Wild quinine is not part of the sale, but here are two native plants that I find don't spread aggressively that bloom for a long period that look great. Rattlesnake master, that was the one with the yucca-like leaves and those funky round flowers, tracks like twenty-five different pollinating insects. And wild quinine has big clusters of white flowers, um, big bold leaves. It does spread, but it weaves through plants. It doesn't take over. They've been in my garden for, well, I planted in 2019 and I don't have to divide those. The only ones that I'm, I'm probably thinking of reducing the size might be the agastache, the lavender hyssop, but I like them so much and they're playing nice with their neighbors that it's not bad. So I would kind of check out some of those. I think if you start with plants that you know are not aggressive. Um, Neil DeBull, I'm trying to think if there's on his website, when he talks about plants, he talks about, and so does Prairie Moon on their website, plants that are good for small space landscapes. Um, I am working with MMSD and Fresh Coast Guardians. We're going to do a video on small space rain gardens. And I think, um, you know what, I'm going to work on a handout for uh, small space rain gardens that I will get out to, I'll post on Facebook, share it with with Kelly as well, that maybe we could add it to some of our videos. It won't be happening in the next couple of weeks, but maybe when we get to how to plant the rain garden, I'll have it ready so that you can, um, we'll have it ready to download. So um, a list of those non-aggressive small space, plants good for small space uh, rain garden. So thank you. Great question, Terry. Long answer. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Melinda. Yeah, and I think um, one of the cool things about rain garden plants is like you can start them later in the season, right? I know some of the ones you were showing have a pretty long um, season there. So yeah, even, you know, for sending out the handout in a couple of months, um, still plenty of time. Right, to plant because, you know, and gardens are always evolving, right? Um, I don't care how long you garden, you're always learning something and changing something out. Seemed like a good idea, didn't work out. So we'll try something else. All right. So um, I'm seeing a question from Barbara that actually is related to the sump pump question. Barbara's asking, can you provide the link for calculating the rain garden sump pump discharge um, ratio? I don't, I don't have, you have to figure out the discharge. What I, the um, handout is the Wisconsin Department, if you Google this, this will get you there. Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Rain Garden Guide. 
that will get you or go to Fresh Coast Guardians. They have a link from their website to that. And then it takes you through. Um, I don't know how much water your sump pump is discharging. Only you, you know, because it varies from home to home to home. But what you may want to do is kind of, okay, do I just get a lot of uh, water when it rains? Okay, then I probably am good just figuring on a rain garden that would handle, um, you know, maybe I maybe I don't run my downspout there in addition to the sump pump or I have to double the size, but it's the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources rain garden guide and that'll get you there. And it, it takes you, what I, what I like, don't let the math freak you out, okay? It takes you through this whole process of if you have this kind of soil, you want your rain garden to be this deep. If you've got this kind of, you know, if you're taking the water off of this much of your roof, you're gonna need a rain garden this big. So it, it helps you think it through. And, um, you know, you can always enlarge the garden. I know that's a lot of work, so you wanna get it right the first time if possible. But, you know, with every garden project, we always kind of fine tune as well. So um, check that out. I think that will help a lot. Next question um, from Jay. Jay is asking, is vervain related to heather? It looks like it, doesn't it? Not, no, it isn't. Um, it's in the verbascum family, I think it is. Um, and heather is in the ericaceae family. So, but you know what? For those of us that can't really grow heather very well, it's a good option, right? Because it does kind of look that way, much taller, not quite as dense flowering. But, oh, that's an interesting observation. That's a great way to describe it, Jay. Not related. So that the good news is it's much easier to grow um, if you're not in an area where heather can grow. Well, the next question is from Cindy. Cindy says, I have what I've been told is Canadian goldenrod in my native garden. Um, trying to remove it has been tough. It's aggressive and I didn't plant it. Any tips on managing that? We have Canadian goldenrod in our garden at We Energy Energy Park and we did not plant it. And so um, a couple of things that we've been doing and it's a pretty big garden. So we've been digging and digging, um, you know, uh, trying to avoid, uh, you know, I don't know how you feel about using any chemicals. Um, if you opt to use something like Roundup or Finale, those are total vegetation killers absorbed through the leaves and go into the roots. I would paint it on the leaves of the goldenrod, protect your nearby plants. That will minimize the amount of chemical. Wear gloves, follow the directions. Um, sometimes I'll take a milk jug, cut the bottom out, put it over the top of the weed and spray. Once it hits the soil, it's not absorbed by the plants, um, but digging, digging, digging. And I know it's, we've been struggling with um, Canadian goldenrod, I bet for five years in that garden and we didn't plant it either. So I feel your pain. And the, the bad part is, so here's the other thing. And I have plenty of weeds in my garden. So I'm not being judging or telling you to do something I know is hard, not you know, I know it's hard to do. The earlier we get out, the better because our perennials are smaller. The weeds have all that opportunity to suck up the sunlight and fill in the space. So the earlier we can get out and weed, I mean, the weeds are growing in my garden right now. I went out there and I went, well, I guess I could leave things stand, but I could start weeding now because uh, the weeds are starting to pop up with the sunny days and the warm temperatures we've had in our area. So trying to get at it early, trying to be persistent. Um, if you're okay using a chemical, just being very selective, read and follow label directions carefully so you don't injure your good plants when you're trying to get rid of the weed. Question from Donna. Uh, Donna wants to know, do you fertilize rain gardens? When and how much? You know, a soil test is always a good thing to start with. And a lot of it depends on your soil. Um, many of you probably know I work with mil milorganite. It's the byproduct of Milwaukee Metro Sewage District. It's a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. So it promotes above and below ground growth 
in balance and it doesn't push out lush succulent growth. It also has non-leaching phosphorus, but more importantly, what research found at, I think it was the University of Florida, is when the microorganisms work on releasing the nutrients from the pellets, it releases some of the phosphorus, good for flowering and root development, and potassium, good for hardiness and disease resistant that's in our soils. And malorganite doesn't even contain potassium, so they knew that was coming from the soil and the phosphorus in the leaf tissue, they were measuring leaf tissue um, nutrients, was even higher than it could have been provided by the malorganite. Um, I'm okay using it. Not everyone, you know, it's the byproduct of our wastewater treatment, tested daily, tested weekly. Um, I'll use that when I plant to get the plants off to a good start. But if you have great healthy soil, that's enough for most of these plants. If you have some of those legumes, the lupines, the baptisia, they're going to be adding um, nitrogen to the soil. So a soil test will tell you what, if anything, you need to add. Um, the quality of the plant growth in the area. So you're starting this garden. Was it a healthy lawn that had been fertilized for many years? Probably nutrient rich soil. Was it an area that things struggled and didn't do well? Then maybe you need to add some fertilizer initially. Um, but if you're going to do it, I would always opt for a low nitrogen, slow release. So you don't promote lush succulent growth, that you keep the growth in balance, as opposed to lush succulent growth is more appealing to aphids and mites and, and disease problems. So keeping in the roots in balance with the top is a good way to promote healthy growth. Question from Nicole. Nicole says, I live along Jackson Parkway and have beautiful large maple trees in my yard and they provide a lot of shade. Which plants would you suggest for shaded areas? One of the challenges too is um, making sure you could try to keep your rain garden as far away from the tree as you can because we want to be careful about disturbing the roots. I had uh, my maple in the city, my air conditioner was the street tree, which was a maple. And underneath that tree, um, if you're trying to look for plants that absorb moisture, you may want to opt just for ground covers. And then maybe if there's an area that's further from the tree to put your rain garden. So let's talk some shade plants and then we'll talk some shady rain garden plants because you may be shaded even though you're far from the, the tree. So if it's not a rain garden, coral bells, Siberian bug loss, sedges will do well in rain gardens as well as in just a shade garden in the ground. Uh, Canadian ginger is a native that tolerates shade and once established tolerates the dry shade we often see under maples because the other problem is when we get rain, the tree blocks a lot of the rainfall. So it's not only a lack of light, but it's a lack of moisture because it doesn't reach the ground. And what does reach the ground, the tree roots suck up. So that's another reason if you can keep that rain garden as far away from the tree as possible, better for the tree, better for your rain garden. Um, once some of these more drought tolerant plants um, are established, you'll have better luck. So if you look at our list, we covered columbine, um, the uh, wild geranium, our native geranium, the sedges that I talked about, even that big leaf aster that will take some shade. And if they're stressed, you know, if it's not, you know, moisture is a limiting factor, it, they might not spread as aggressively as some. Um, the first couple of years, you're probably gonna have to water, check the soil moisture. That's true with any rain garden, but especially if, if it's being shaded by a tree. Um, so you may want to consider rather than a rain garden, unless, you know, maybe it's a rain barrel instead, or maybe it's a rain garden in another part of the house where you direct your downspout. And then you're just looking at a planting under your trees, which is better for the tree, will also help absorb moisture and mulch will help capture the moisture. So when we talk about seven ways to manage water, rainwater, we're going to talk about all of those things that would work for it. Um, your cardinal flower is a great uh, moisture loving plant. Turtle head, great rain garden plant. We didn't talk about that. It's not part of the sale, but it's an excellent plant. 
Um, we have turtle head, we have Joe pie weed in our rain garden at the fair. We have um, cardinal flower, we have sedges, we have palm sedge, which is pretty aggressive. So to my friend, don't put that in there who was asking about non-aggressive plants. We've got some uh, cone flower along the edges that tend to be a little drier, but those all took shade. Turtle head, the sedges, the cardinal flower, even great, uh, great blue lobelia will also take um, some shade as well. So Bob is wondering, would feverfew fit in there? Um, I have fun with this. It's aggressive and spreading. I was going to say it's an aggressive plant. Um, it's pretty tough. So I, if you don't mind managing it, if you put it in your grain garden and you're able to contain it, or it sounds like you're enjoying it, so you know what you're in for. Um, yeah, I'd probably start it on the um, not on the far outer edges, but kind of in the middle, but it's a pretty tough and aggressive plant. So pretty adaptable. So it'll find its way to where it wants to grow in your rain garden based on moisture. So as long as you know what you're in for, it's worth giving it a try. Just, you know, keep an eye on it. We have a comment from Chris. Chris says, thanks for covering sweetgrass tonight. I also enjoyed reading Brady's Brady sweetgrass and wondered about adding it to my moist, wet area. I had been hesitant about its aggressiveness, but I think I'll give it a try. Well, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing, Chris, after reading this book, because I had the plant in my hand at the garden center and I said, oh, put it back. But this year I'm going to put it in my cart and grow it and commit to trying to manage it. So we'll just have to start making baskets, Chris. That's my goal. <laughs> I have to give a little plug for the library there too. If you're interested in reading Braiding Sweetgrass, we've got a ton of copies in our library system. So you can probably pick one up at your neighborhood library. Um, last question right now is from Crystal. Crystal says, should I try to remove creeping bellflower before planting a rain garden in the area? What's the best oh. way to remove it? Thank you. Sorry, creeping bellflower. Sorry, it is so, as you know, Crystal, and anyone else fighting it, it is a tough one. It's spread by rhizomes. It's very aggressive. It's very adaptable. I, you are going to be much happier if you manage it before, because you're going to end up digging to create your rain garden. So you will be removing some of those rhizomes. Um, you may want to, if you don't mind using a chemical, you may want to treat and... Boy, that's a tough one um, because any part of those rhizomes, that underground stem can start a new plant. And so I'm worried if you're digging up your rain garden to put it the right depth, then you add in some organic matter, then you plant your rain garden plants. I'm worried you're gonna be spreading, you're gonna be propagating that creeping bellflower. So I think if you can get it under control, if that's the area where you need to put your rain garden, um, I would try to control it first. That's gonna delay planting. Fall is a great time to plant too. I know you probably don't wanna spend the summer killing it, but um, I would treat it with a total vegetation killer it's probably going to re-sprout. It's going to take you several applications. Again, I try not to use chemicals, but there are times when um, digging is going to take you several years and persistent. And if you leave any piece behind, it's a tough one to, you know, you're going to start more plants. So it might be a place where you go, I'm going to use it as a stopgap. I'm going to get this weed under control. And then when you know that garden is clear of it, then start your rain garden. Because I'm just worried if you do your digging and your tilling, you're just going to end up propagating it and you'll have a rain garden of creeping bellflower. And I, I'm i sorry you're dealing with it. It's a tough one, as you know. So if you have any other questions, feel free to drop them in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, just a reminder, we'll send out the handout from tonight and a follow-up email along with a link to the recording. Um, let's see, today's Thursday, probably early next week is my guess. Um, we'll be able to have that posted on our YouTube channel, and then we can send out that link to the recording. Um, and then also links to register for Melinda's upcoming webinars. We've got Thank one. You. Sure. Yeah, we've got one on April 11th. That is the seven steps to managing water where it falls in your yard. And then we have, um, May 9th, how to plant your rain garden. So once you select your plants, and we'll talk about how to plant them. Um, and then I'll also throw in um, that link to the MMSD plant sale. Again, it's Thank open you. until April 4th. 
um, open until that date, or if they sell out first, then it'll be closed before that date. Um, but also we've got some in-person rain barrel workshops oh, yeah. with MMSD, so much going on this spring. Um, and I'll send out a link to that as well. We've got one, I think there's a few spots open at the Bayview one coming up on the 23rd. So just a uh, word to the wise, sign up um, for the, they they fill up really quickly, I will say. Um, so the trick with those though, too, you have to be in MMSD's service area to be eligible for a free rain barrel. Um, but, you know, if you check those boxes, then it's a really great workshop. You can get hands-on um, practice with um, installing that too. So um, yeah, lots more to look forward to this spring and summer. Um, just checking if there's any last questions. I don't see any. So yeah, I guess we are all set for this evening. Melinda, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all this great information. Um, Thank you, Kelly, and thanks to all of you who are still here with us. We appreciate it. And info at melindamyers.com. If you do have questions, be patient with me. I'm outnumbered, but I'll try to get to them. Or if it's a, something I need to include in the upcoming ones that you're dying to learn, make sure you let me know. So these are for you. So we try to figure out what would help you be successful. So I want to thank uh, Kelly again for hosting this uh, webinar. It's always fun to team up with the library because we they are such a great community asset set that we need to support that they take care of us so we need to help take care of them as well so thank you kelly thanks to all of you i'm seeing lots of things in the chat box here so thank you and uh let's look forward to a great spring um, yes. check out more events at mpl.org and also grab a copy of braiding sweetgrass while you're there yes. as well so thanks everyone have a great evening we'll see you next time take care bye, -bye now